Good morning, everyone. My name is Mark Wilder. I'm here today with Nishant Unikrishnan. We are application engineers with Yaskawa America, and we are going to talk today about practical applications of conveyor tracking. Hopefully, a couple weeks ago, you saw our introduction to conveyor tracking. If you did not, then you may find some of this stuff a little bit uh, a little bit hard to understand at first, and I encourage that you go and find the Introduction to Conveyor Tracking uh, webinar video on yaskawa.com or on YouTube. Just search for Intro to Conveyor Tracking and you should find those. And as we mentioned in that webinar, we do have a quick reference guide that we've created, and that's available on yaskawa.com um, just to kind of help you get through all of the different options for track conveyor belt. So go to yaskawa.com and search for conveyor tracking quick reference or the document number you see on the screen and you should be able to find that. So today what we're going to talk about as opposed to the introduction is some actual practical applications and code that you would see when you're using conveyor tracking in your application. So we're going to start with a very simple application and work our way more and more difficult. So we're going to start with just a simple single axis moving along a conveyor. Um, we're going to call that a gluing application. Then we're going to move on one more step and have a z-axis go down and uh, stamp something on the part. That'll be our stamping. We're going to take a little interlude at that point and talk about the use of vision systems in conveyor tracking. And then we'll do our third example using that conveyor system in a pick and place type application. So let's get right on our first example, which is gluing. In this particular one, we're going to use a photo eye as our sensor. We're not going to have any parts buffered. We're only going to do one at a time. And we're not going to do any PCS moves during the application. Now this may seem like a, an application that you wouldn't uh, see very much with conveyor tracking, but it's perfectly um, easy to understand uh, application and it does have a lot of practical values. One example of this um, that we've seen in the past is a cut to length application where we are feeding forward some wood and we need to move along with it while we uh, cut that wood. We've traditionally used camming for this but there are some downsides to camming, um, namely that you always need to come back to the beginning point when you're doing that. And uh, with conveyor tracking, that's no longer necessary. So that's one example of something that's actually not a conveyor, but can uh, take advantage of the conveyor tracking application. But in this case, we're going to do gluing. And what I have here is uh, our part. It's a 10 by 10 by 10 inch or a centimeter cube. And we just basically want to squirt a little glue right on the top of it as it's coming by. We have a ball screw running parallel to that in the X direction of the conveyor. And on that, we are carrying a glue pump with a little glue nozzle that will be automatically lined up right above the part and uh, along the center of the uh, y-axis of the part. The part will be triggered by a latch input, as we said. Once we uh, get that latch and the part gets within our synchronization zone, we will turn on an output to activate the glue dispenser and start dispensing glue. And we need to leave that on for two seconds in order to get the appropriate amount of glue on our part. One last piece of data, which is that uh, 300 centimeters is as far as we can go with this uh, ball screw mechanism. So let's uh, figure out what we need to do. And we're going to do a little flow chart here. And the first thing we're going to need to do in this flow chart is determine what the fixed data of the MC track conveyor belt is. So we can see our track conveyor belt function block, the one we talked about so much in depth during our introduction. And um, it's got a bunch of inputs. The ones with arrows are the ones that I think we can actually get for this application ahead of time. We obviously know what our axis group is. We know what the conveyor belt axis is. We're going to need to determine the conveyor belt origin. In this particular case, using a sensor, we'll have a fixed initial object position. Our start distance and end distance will need to be determined, as well as our track options and our execution mode. We actually, in this particular case, are going to use the default immediate execution mode. So let's put some numbers on our application. Again, we're kind of zoomed in now. We're looking down on a conveyor belt. We see our part coming in as a 10 by 10 by 10 cube. 
And we've decided that we want our conveyor belt origin right at the sensor point. We typically recommend this as the, uh, the place to do this. So we have to determine what that conveyor belt origin is, but we'll get to that. We can see that we've, our MCS origin is right where the ball screw is uh, um, running in the Y direction. And the, in the X direction, we are uh, right here in the center of our, of our carriage. And um, we're going to start right in the middle of our synchronized in zone where we're sinking in. And uh, 15 centimeters is what it's going to take us to actually synchronize from our starting point to the end of that synchronized zone. So the first question is, what is our conveyor belt origin? What is the value that we're going to put in that, that field? Well, the conveyor belt origin, as you'll recall, is a offset from the MCS origin. Now, we're fortunate in this particular application that our X and our Y and our Z are all in the same directions between the uh, MCS and the conveyor belt. So we're not going to have to worry about any rotational offsets. We're just going to need to worry about our uh, positional offsets. So in the X direction, we can see that the conveyor belt is 50 centimeters in the negative X direction of the MCS. And in the y direction, it is a negative 30 centimeters. 30 centimeters in the negative y direction. So that's, uh, let me pull up a pen here. Our 50 centimeters here in the negative, and our 30 centimeters here in the uh, y negative. So our value then is minus 50 in the x, minus 30 in the y and zeros for the rest. We don't have a z-axis in this application, so our glue nozzle must be directly above uh, the part where it needs to be. Our next question is, what is the initial object position value? So when our part, this cube here, trips the sensor, that is going to be the position that's recorded but what is our initial offset position from that part? Since we have a 10 by 10 by 10 cube and we want our glue to be deposited right in the center of that, we are going to need to offset it by five units in the negative x direction. This is, again, picture this cube right up when it's uh, triggered this latch and we're gonna have to go back five units in order to get to the center of that cube. The height of the cube is not going to matter. Again, we don't have a z-axis, so our z-axis must just be properly aligned. Same with the y-axis. So our initial object position is minus 5 in the x direction. The next question is, what is the start distance? Well, we have all the information we need as long as we remember that we're starting in the center of this sink-in zone. So that means if it's 15 centimeters on the... Uh, the leading side, then it must be 15 centimeters on the trailing side. I think we can all do the math of 50 centimeters minus 15 centimeters to give us our 35 centimeters. That is from here to here. And get the arrow back. Our end distance, not shown on this slide, but if you remember on the previous slide, 300 millimeters was as far as the ball screw could move. Now we have to take care of our track options. If you remember track options, they are going to be what determines how far and when we synchronize in and synchronize out. So our sync in conveyor distance, again, we're starting in the middle. If it's 15 on the leading, it's 15 on the trailing. So that's 30 centimeters that the conveyor is going, oops, that the conveyor is going to move during the sync in. The tool center point being halfway through means that we're going to move it 15 centimeters during the synchronize in. And then we'll need to define that zone for the output as well. So the synchronized output, sync out again, the conveyor will move 30 um, centimeters. Now one might ask, why are we starting in the middle? And if you recall from the um, previous lecture, let me open my link here. If you recall from the previous lecture that this 
center distance being halfway through the sink in zone will give us the ideal, this blue line, which is the ideal sink in. If we started farther back, we'd have to overspeed. If we started farther forward, we may actually even have reversing of the, uh, of the X axis. So by starting in the middle, which is the default, we will have the longest time to accelerate without overspeeding. So that is our recommended uh, start point. Uh, one more question uh, that actually comes up with this is how far does this cube actually move from the point that it's latched to the point that the synchronization begins, the start of movement of the tool center point or the glue nozzle in this case. How far is this going to move, the cube going to move, before the tool center point begins uh, to move? Now your first thought is probably, well, we already said that the start distance is 35 centimeters, so it's going to move 35 centimeters. But we have to remember that we're not triggering that based on the leading edge of the cube, but because we have an initial offset position of minus 5, we're actually going to have to wait until that center point of the cube crosses into the synchronization zone. So our actual conveyor distance that we're going to move between getting the trigger and between starting the synchronization project, uh, starting the synchronization process is 40 centimeters. The 35 for the start distance plus the 5 for the initial offset position. I'm sorry, initial object position. So now that we have the fixed data of MC track conveyor belt, we are ready to kind of uh, start our project of, uh, of tracking along these parts. So the first thing we need to do is move our tool center point to the ready position, that is the center of the synchronized in area. And that's just a standard MC move linear absolute function block. This wait for tracking position would be that starting point that's at the center of the sync in area. Zero in this case. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to wait for a part to trip our latch. And we can use MC Touch Probe to do this, although in general now we tend to use product buffer for all of our latching needs. So in this case we'll be using uh, product buffer. But it's the same idea. We're waiting for a latch to occur. Once that latch has occurred, we now have the position where the part has crossed the sensor, that's the conveyor position, at the time the part crossed the sensor, and we'll be ready to execute track conveyor belt. So our recorded position comes from our data buffer, and once we have a part in the buffer we can execute MC track conveyor belt. At this time it will wait for the part to get into the sync zone and then the TCP will start moving and at the end of the sync in zone the TCP, our glue nozzle in this case, will be synchronized with the part. At that time I can turn on my glue dispenser, wait for two seconds, and then turn my glue back off. Simple logic on that one. At that point I am ready to complete the circle and move back to the TCP ready position and get ready for the next part. So this is a very simple application with just a single axis and just turning on an output uh, when we are executing it. When we actually take a logic analyzer trace of this, this is what we see. And Nishant is going to uh, go through this logic analyzer trace with you. Thanks, Mark. So we have a, a set of, set of uh, variables that we have plotted on this logic analyzer trace. Uh, the x-axis that you see at the bottom, uh, which is common for all these variables, is time. The x-axis is time, and, and y-axis represent all the different variables. Uh, the, the, the variable we have at the very bottom here is the trigger. This is the sensor, which is obtained using your high-speed latching input uh, circuit. That's where the trigger was uh, obtained. The very first variable that we have on the plot is conveyor position. It basically tells you that you have a conveyor uh, 
traveling at uniform speed, increasing in position. Uh, the second variable that we have is the position of the x-axis of the ball screw, or the x-direction of the ball screw is basic, or x-direction, or the positive direction of the ball screw motion is plotted here. Conveyor velocity, constant velocity, uh, 10 units. And this is the, the, the fourth variable is the velocity of the ball screw. Uh, and you can see that after the part has been triggered here at the very bottom, uh, the, the, the center of the part has to travel uh, the distance, which Mark mentioned earlier, it's the 35 plus 5 units, which is 40 units, have to pass before the, the uh, ball screw's TCP starts moving in the positive x direction or slowly starts ramping up with an S-curve velocity profile, as you can see here. And uh, once it gets into track state 3, uh, which is the synchronous, synchronized part of your conveyor tracking is when the speed really matches to the conveyor speed. The TCP speed and the conveyor speed match at this point when your track state is three. And uh, the output gets turned on for two seconds. You can see that's the, that's the time when the in-sync output of your conveyor track block, MC conveyor, track conveyor belt block, gets true. And the glue pump output uh, becomes true at the same time. Uh, the speed is matching with the conveyor's velocity and you have conveyor tracking happening. Now after the two seconds have passed, the conveyor track block is uh, aborted by the uh, move back to the initial position and that's an MC move linear absolute. And you can see here that MC move linear absolute takes back the TCP of your ball screw back to its home position of zero. Now mind you, this is just an example of one trigger for ca causing the uh, conveyor or causing conveyor track to activate when the conveyor when the part when the conveyor the TCP was already waiting uh, for the part it was hovering over the part and uh, once the part got to within your synchronous region it slowly ramped up velocity tracked for two seconds and then went back to its home position. All right, thank you, Nishap. Again, it's worth uh, repeating that this move back to our initial position cancels conveyor tracking. Remember that there are multiple ways to cancel conveyor tracking, but any MCS move that's executed while conveyor tracking is active will cancel conveyor tracking. That happens right at this point right here. So let's take a look at our second example. It's going to increase just very slightly in complexity over our previous example. We're still going to use a photo eye as our sensor, but now we're going to see what happens when we have buffered parts and when we execute PCS moves during the execution of conveyor tracking. So um, here we have our second application. Instead of looking from the top view now, we're going to be looking from the side view. So again, we have a ball screw on our x-axis. In this case, we also have a ball screw on our y-axis. The same parts coming in, a 10 by 10 by 10 centimeter cube and um, all the same uh, information for our, our conveyor, di conveyor distances and uh, start distance, et cetera. So this is the flow chart we came up with at the end of the gluing. And essentially, it's the same thing we're going to do for our stamping. Couple changes. One is instead of having the MC Touch probe, we're definitely going to be using the product buffer function block here. And when our buffer level is greater than zero, in other words, we have a part buffered, we're going to want to make sure we execute. And of course, instead of doing dispensing of glue, we are going to do a stamping move. That's a PCS move down and then a PCS move back up. So really, this is the same application as we had before except now we've done these PCS moves. So you can see a PCS move down and then a PCS move back up to retract afterwards. And again, we have a graph of this and this is gonna be a little bit different than before because now we have a part buffered while we are acting on the previous part. So again, Nishant's gonna talk about this logic analyzer chart. There was a question earlier which uh, asked about the optimal ratio for the sink in distance or the sink-in distance with uh, the conveyor distance, I believe. And uh, the answer to that is, uh, if you want a smooth S-curve, uh, 
without any overshoot or undershoots, you would basically have to have the TCP move half the distance of the conveyor. That would be the optimal ratio or a smooth S-curve that does not have any overshoot in either direction. Coming back to this uh, graph here, the uh, x-axis, uh, like in the previous example, refers to time, and the other parameters are uh, individual variables on the y-axis. Uh, again, the very first uh, variable here is conveyor position increasing linearly. Uh, the, the, the gantries or the, uh, the ball screws x position is shown here, which is the second variable in red. Uh, we have an additional uh, axis of motion, which is the Z motion for the stamping application, which is uh, uh, up and down. The conveyor velocity is a constant. Uh, the, the X directions TCP velocity of the ball screw is shown here. Uh, the track state is uh, the one shown as the uh, uh, sixth variable. And then, of course, you have your in sync and your speed match uh, plots, and we, we, we will discuss that. So as you can see, the very first uh, time the, the sensor gets triggered, uh, you do have you do have your latch, which captures the position of the conveyor, and the uh, the the gantry has to wait, or the the ball screw has to wait for 40 units, just like in the previous example, it has to wait for 40 units to pass, 40 units on the conveyor to pass before the TCP slowly starts ramping up in in, in velocity. You can see the S curve shape; it ramps up and matches speed, uh, and at that point, you have your Z axis go down to stamp and then come back up. And that is a PCS move down and a PCS move up. Those are the only two moves that are extra in this particular example. But you can see here that while your stamping of the first part is taking place, you had the second part cross through the sensor, bro broke the sensor, and that position got latched, added to the product buffer. And since you are in the middle of conveyor tracking the very first part, you're not going to do anything with that until you're done with the tracking of the first part. So as soon as the tracking is done, we, we add that block, we add that part into the planning for conveyor tracking for the next, uh, for the next cycle of conveyor tracking. And as you can see that the, the, uh, the, the TCP of the ball screw does not have to go all the way back, as you imagine, it, it basically can be stopped or it needs to slow down on its way back and head in the in the opposite direction while the part is moving along the conveyor while the second part is coming along the conveyor and you can see that the uh, in the position plot you can see that the uh, the the TCP does not go all the way back to home and stop it instead intercepts the second part midway and then starts tracking along and you can see here this is the speed matching region where the second part, the sec where the uh, TCP of the ball screw matches speed with the second part that comes along and stamping takes place. <clears throat> and this is evident from the, uh, from the plot of the position, the X position of the uh, ball screw, that it does not go all the way back, but instead uh, stops, decelerates, stops, and returns and goes in the same direction of motion as the part. Uh, one thing to note here is you can see that the in-sync output of the conveyor track block actually gets turned on when track state 3 comes on. But that does not necessarily mean that you are speed matching. All that means is that your, uh, the, the conveyor distance has crossed and the conveyor track block has locked that part in its target and it is, it is, it, it, it is ready to track. It just means that, you know, if you had a previous motion that was happening, like in this case, the previous motion was your MCS move back to its home position, that move has to be superimposed with the conveyor's position in order to get speed matching. And this is exactly when the two moves are, you know, when the, when the previous move is done and your conveyor tracking is in, in sync, that's when you do have your speed matching for two seconds. So the in sync alone in sync output of the conveyor track block alone does not mean that you are in in uh, speed match area. It, it ba barely means that your the 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 part is locked. But if you had a previous move that was active, that move has to get done before you can say that you are really in speed match and you're doing only conveyor tracking at that point.
So that's something that you have to keep in mind. The, the difference between these two plots is in, in making sure that your conveyor tracking is in sync and the previous motion has completed. And that's when you know that you are in sync with the conveyor. And this is because conveyor tracking is a superimposed move that is a move that is uh, placed on top of another already existing move. So that is important to note here. And once that's done, uh, it, it, it basically goes all the way back to the home position. You can see here the, next, the move absolute, MCS move absolute uh, block will take it back to the home position if your buffer is empty, which, which is the case here. Yeah, and again, in the project then, this is the Z move is triggered instead of just in sync, it's triggered by in sync and the MCS move um, that's moving back to zero being finished. So th those two things are required in order for, in this case, the speed matched output to come on. So again, this is just showing the delay between when you get the second trigger and when you begin acting on that second part coming in. That's what the shaded area shows. So at this point, we need to talk a little bit about vision systems because our next example is going to use vision systems. And there are some things you're gonna to need to know in order to uh, properly set up your conveyor tracking when you're using a vision system. There's kind of a couple ways to do it. We're gonna start with the simpler version, of course, and that is using a direct TCP, again, that's tool center point teach method. So when you're setting up a camera, it's gonna have a field of view, and in there to set it up, you're going to put in a calibration grid. And this calibration grid is just a grid of dots that you're gonna to tape to your conveyor belt, and you're going to align it up perfectly so that the dots run along the x-axis of, uh, of the conveyor belt. Again, it's important that you get the x-axis of the conveyor belt very precise. So with this calibration grid, you're going to line it up using your camera and figure out where your reference point for the camera is going to be. And we're going to call that reference point also our conveyor belt origin, CBO. So now we have our CBO determined by the camera. We know what dots we used in order to do that. We know right where the origin is of this um, reference area. And then very simply, in order to determine the conveyor belt offset, we can just manually jog or manually move our tool center point from the MCS origin to that camera reference point slash conveyor belt origin. So when we move that, we now have an updated PCS, or I'm sorry, updated MCS position up here in the uh, corner that will show us that we've moved 50 in the X direction negative and 30 in the Y direction negative. So this is one way that we can determine our conveyor belt origin just by directly moving the tool center point to that origin and using that as our CBO. However, in many instances, the uh, the tool center point can't actually reach the area where the camera field of view is. So we're not able to just move the tool center point to the uh, conveyor belt origin. So in this case, the dashed orange line is telling us how far we can move that tool center point. Our process, though, is going to start off the same. We're going to use the calibration grid. And we are going to use the reference point that we develop as our conveyor belt origin. However, we cannot directly move the TCP there as we've discussed. So what we're going to do now is we're going to jog the conveyor forward until that calibration grid is in our synchronized zone. So let's jog the conveyor forward. There we go. And now that calibration grid is in our... Um, robot workspace. So now we can move the TCP to this new point. Now when we jogged it forward, we had to be sure that we recorded the position before we jogged it forward, and now we'll record the position after we jogged it forward. And that distance that the uh, conveyor moved, we're going to use that in just a second. Now that we have our new kind of offset point, we can manually move our 
TCP to that new point, that grid reference point. We're going to talk a little this. We're going to talk about this in more depth in just a second. We're then going to use a couple function blocks, um, specifically the uh, frame type transform function block, in order to determine what the MCS position is at this kind of intermediate um, conveyor belt spot. The next slide will discuss this in more detail. So we've moved our calibration grid into the zone, and now we can teach this new frame with just three points. And what we're going to do is we're going to start with some sort of pointer or some sort of um, exact TCP point, and we're going to start that at the exact same origin that we used when we set up the camera. So the point that was the camera's origin will also be the OO or origin point for this transform. Then we are going to move our TCP in the positive X direction. It does not matter how far, just in the positive X direction. We are going to then teach that point as XX, and then we are going to move it in the positive Y direction. Again, it does not matter how far, um, but only in the Y direction. We don't want to change the X anymore. And we're going to record that point as XY. So now we have three points. The origin point, OO, moving it forward in the X direction, we get XX, and then moving it in the positive Y direction, we get XY. And those three points are going to go into this function block frame type transform, and that's going to tell us what the coordinates are of that position, or that frame, in the MCS coordinate system. We are then going to take those coordinates and we're going to feed them into another function block, the calc frame offset function block. So now I have this frame, but the frame is in the synchronization zone. It's not where the actual conveyor belt origin is. And this is where that conveyor distance that we grabbed before is going to come in handy. We take that difference in conveyor position. It's going to be a negative value because we're trying to transform or, or offset this position in the negative x direction. And we are going to put that in as our offset in that direction. So in this case, our offset will only have a negative x component. So between these two blocks, the first one, which determines a frame for where this calibration grid now is in the sync zone, and the second one, which then offsets that back to the conveyor belt origin, those two things can be used to determine what that conveyor belt origin output should be. So at this point, you would take the output frame and use that as the origin of your conveyor belt. Now again, when we're teaching, it's important to understand that this X direction is very important, both when you're teaching and calibrating the camera and when you're doing this frame type transform. The positive X direction has to be the direction of travel of the conveyor belt. So it's very important to make sure that when we're getting from the origin to the XX point, that is moving directly along the X-axis of the conveyor belt. And then the Y-axis, obviously, will be perpendicular to that. Very important. One question that came up is, uh, does this method require the two X-axes to be absolutely parallel? Um, not only parallel, but the two, well, I guess parallel is, is fine to say it that way, but they're going to be along the exact same line. So when you jog the x-axis, I'm sorry, when you jog the calibration grid forward, you've already calibrated it so that it is exactly lined up in the x direction. So when you jog it forward, it must now still be right along that same line in the x direction. So yes, it is absolutely important that the um, x-axis direction, the x-x point from the OO point is in the same um, line for both the conveyor belt origin and the um, uh, setting up this transform. This will actually, uh, this method works, you know, in, in, our, in our examples we've shown that the MCS origin and the uh, CBO, the conveyor belt origin, are in the same orientation, x pointing in the same direction, y pointing in the same direction. That is not important. 
our MCS uh, origin can be in any orientation relative to the conveyor belt, and this method will work, as, as well as the direct TCP teach method. Um, you just have to make sure that, again, you are moving in the x-axis direction of the conveyor. The x-axis, the conveyor will always move in the positive x-axis direction. So here's an example uh, that we talked about a little bit uh, in our previous um, application. So here our MCS origin is going in completely the opposite uh, um, directions as our conveyor belt origin, the yellow cross over here. So this method that we just talked about will work just fine in this application as well. It's done the exact same way. We just, again, got to make sure that that x direction is the direction of conveyor travel when we set it up. Yeah, and here you can see another example where the MCS might be um, perfectly aligned and the uh, you know uh, x-axis to the right, y-axis going up on the slide. Um, and you'll have a RZ component in it because it's going to be uh, twisted a little bit, but it, the same method will work. All right, so between frame type transform to get us that kind of intermediate origin point and the calc frame offset to complete our offset back to the actual conveyor belt origin, those two things combined um, can be used in order to teach the conveyor belt origin from the MCS actual position. So that's teaching the conveyor belt origin, but the other thing we need to talk about is how are we actually interacting with the camera? How are we using this vision system in our conveyor tracking application? Well, the way that we recommend doing it is to use the MPIEC controller to send a digital output as a trigger to the camera. Now, we're going to send that at a constant uh, interval. Probably a position interval makes more sense than a time interval. But we're going to make sure that uh, we get the entire field of range covered. So. When the conveyor moves forward a certain distance, we want to take a picture, but we want to make sure that we don't have any blind spots. So on the bottom here, I have my conveyor. I have the camera set up. The dashed red line with the yellow in the middle of it is my field of view. And these parts are going to come through. And then I just want to, based on the speed of the conveyor belt, every so often trigger the camera in order to uh, take my image uh, that can be processed. As we move forward here, you'll see the camera just taking snapshots every so often in order to get those um, parts coming in. That same signal that we're using as a camera trigger can also be then looped back into the controller as a latch. This is to get the um, the position that the conveyor was at when we took that snapshot. In our particular example, we actually didn't use a latch uh, to do that. We just uh, kind of wrote the position to a memory block. Um, that's fine if you're, you know, depending on the accuracy that you need. But the most accurate way to do it is to use the high speed latch function in order to get that point. So now we have told the camera to take a series of pictures every um, num certain number of units of the uh, conveyor belt, and we have captured the position that we were at when we told it to take those snapshots. But now what we need to do is get the data from the camera. Now this data is going to probably come in over a network, either Modbus or Ethernet IP. and it is not going to happen at the exact same second that we trigger the camera. So we need to then just monitor the Ethernet IP data coming back from the camera, and there will usually be some sort of flag that tells you that new part data has arrived. So then we, we look at when we sent the camera uh, data, we wait for the next set of data to come back, and we know that that's our new data. And then we can take that data along with the position that we captured as a latch, and we can use those together to basically come up with our buffered positions. So we have a latch position, and each latch position, again, if there's more than one part in the field of view, then you'll have more than one part at that latch position, 
although the part data, the, uh, which we're going to use as initial object positions, that will be different. So you can see two things were latched the first time we took a picture. The conveyor position was 100 and there were two different parts. So that's going to be two different vectors from the reference point of the camera to tell us where those parts were. Again, in reference to the camera's reference point. Then as the conveyor was moving forward, it moved a certain distance and we triggered the camera again. And again, there were two parts in the field of view of the camera, and those are the parts that are listed with the latch position of 346 units. So we moved, uh, or, or the conveyor kept moving forward, and that same amount of distance later, we did it again, and again there were two parts in there, et cetera. So now we have our buffer of both the position that the conveyor was at when we triggered, and the data from whatever parts it found um, in the uh, field of view. So now that we have that information, we can basically then execute conveyor tracking using that latched position, the conveyor position, as our recorded position. And then the uh, part data that we get in will be our initial object position in the MC track conveyor belt function block. So we have all the information that we need at that point. So again, just to recap, Basically, repeated triggering of the camera, as well as looping back into its own latch, recording those positions and coordinating them with the data coming back over Ethernet IP in order to get our list of uh, parts that are coming down this, um, this conveyor belt. So now that we know a little bit about a camera, let's go ahead and use one in our third application, which is going to be a pick and place application. So here is our... Um, application overview. The top is showing a top-down view, looking down onto the top of the conveyor. The bottom we see the same application but a side view. So now we have three axes, an x-axis moving along the same x-axis as the conveyor, y-axis moving directly across it, and a z-axis moving up and down. There's also actually, kind of not shown in this picture, but there's also an rz axis. Um, you'll notice that the parts that are kind of waiting under the uh, camera right now have a rotation to them. So in order to pick them up, we will also uh, want to rotate. So again, all the numbers are going to kind of be the same as before. We're not going to get too much into how we actually call track conveyor belt. But we do have to remember that our initial object position that used to be a fixed value when we were dealing with a sensor is now going to not be fixed and we're going to use the initial object positions we get from the vision system. So for every part, we're going to have two changing pieces of data, the recorded position and the initial object position. So as we've done all along, let's go ahead and build our flowchart of how this is going to work. Again, the fixed data of, of track conveyor belt we covered earlier, the initial object position is not going to be fixed at this point. Then we can start triggering our camera every X units of the conveyor, whatever that unit is, so that every time you take a snapshot, you're, you're getting the parts that are in the field of view without missing any and without too much overlap. We don't want to act on a part twice. And then we can move our TCP to the ready position. We're defining the ready position as the uh, position with the Z axis lifted and again, right over the middle of the um, sink in zone. So we move to that, what we were calling the conveyor track hover position with the z-axis lifted right in the middle of that, um, of that zone. Same place we've been starting all along. At this point, we're basically going to wait until the buffer has parts. Once the buffer has parts, we're going to start tracking them. If our buffer level is not equal to zero, that means that we must have a part in the buffer. And when it does, then we are going to move to um, move the trigger position. That's the, the position that the conveyor was at when we triggered the camera to our recorded position in our function block. We are going to move the data from the camera that we got over Ethernet IP to the initial object position. And we are going to execute our conveyor tracking. So those three things are shown here the recorded position we got from our latch loopback, the initial object position we got from the uh, 
uh, camera data over Ethernet IP, and since there's a part in the buffer, we are going to go ahead and execute. Once the uh, track conveyor belt becomes busy, we can move to PCS 000. 000. What this is going to do is, I mean, uh, normally a, what a PCS zero move will do is to move directly over the part and track along. But at this point, the part may not be within the sync zone. So it's going to move along the Y axis to, to line up with where the part is going to be, but it can't actually start moving in the X axis and track until that part is in the sync zone and actually until that part is synchronized, that's when we know that uh, um, we're at zero, zero, zero. But we're now in the hover position, so our Z axis is actually uh, minus 30 right now. Again, that's a standard uh, move linear absolute. So it'll do its Y axis offset that it needs to do in order to line up with where the PCS is going to come into the uh, synchronization zone, but it can't do any x-axis uh, moves to go back to that part. When that PCS hover move is done, then that means that we have successfully moved to 000, which means that that must be um, in the synchronization zone, because that PCS hover move that's trying to get to the x-axis zero can't get there until the synchronization move is complete. So once that PCS hover move is done, we know that we are in sync and we are directly over our part and we can do our PCS moves down to pick it and then back up to pick it up. So again, two standard moves. These are in the PCS part coordinate system. So even though it's a linear move basically straight down because the part is moving down the conveyor the x-axis of the group will track along the x-axis of the conveyor. So we go down, get the part, and pick it back up. Then we do an MCS move to the hover point for placement, where we want to put the part. An MCS move, as you'll recall, cancels the tracking relationship. So we are no longer tracking in the x direction of the conveyor because we have executed an MCS um, placement move. Then we're in the hover position. Then of course we move a, do an MCS move down to the release position and we release our, so again, pretty standard. We, um, what we have just accomplished, remember, is we did a PCS move down and then back up to pick up the part. So we're still at that point tracking. And then we execute this first MCS move to the placement hover position that cancels our tracking. We are over where we need to put it down. We do a this middle move here, which is to move it to the down position. We release the air valve or whatever's holding our part, and then we move back up to the hover position directly above it. And at this point, we can, that's our, our up move to get back to our hover position. And at this point, we can do a move back to the TCP ready position. Now in our example, we had four parts coming in, so we don't want to go back to the ready position if, the, if there's another part to act on. So we certainly don't want to wait until we're done to move from, um, let me get my pen back, to move from this step that I marked with an X to this step that I marked with a Y. We don't want to move from the TCP ready position and then wait until that's done before we check and see if the buffer has parts, we can instead just command the move to the ready position. And after it's been commanded and it's in process and it's ready to move back, then if the buffer has parts, we will just um, go ahead and execute our conveyor tracking again right away and do our, piece, our, our uh, move to the PCS000. And that will kind of blend with this uh, return move and uh, get us all ready for the next part coming in. Uh, we're going to go back to Nishant to talk about this graph of this um, four boxes coming in uh, in one uh, camera trigger. All right, so we have four parts with each with their own unique initial object positions that were captured by the camera. Uh, the recorded position 
on 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 all the four parts for for all the four parts is the same. So this is basically one unique recorded position because that was one last conveyor position, but it got four unique initial object positions in that camera field of view. Uh, the four parts were uh, in different positions of the camera, uh, and in this example, you had two parts that were ahead of the CBO, two parts that were behind the CBO when the capture occurred, and. Uh, the, the four parts, the very first part that was captured did not have any uh, orientation difference delta with the CBO, but the other three had increasing levels of uh, RZ rotations. Uh, again, in, in, this, uh, in this plot, uh, we have conveyor distance uh, in the, in the uh, first, which is the first variable. That's the first uh, plot you see there. The X position of the ball screw or the gantry system is what you see in the second uh, plot. The Y position is the third one. The Z up and down motion for pick and place is what you see in the fourth plot. Velocities in five and six, and of course track state. I have not shown the uh, sensor latch uh, that, because this, this plot was fairly long. It took about uh, 15, uh, 150 milliseconds or 100, 150 seconds for this plot to uh, complete. Uh, we were, we're trying to simulate this. Uh, the last plot that you see is your uh, RZ, which is the rotation of the of the of the TCP at the at the end of the gantry. Uh, so the very first part you can see here uh, gets tracked. Uh, the 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 TCP was already waiting at the hover position for the part to come through, and it, it basically goes and tracks it. Uh, once it tracks and the speed matches, uh, the TCP goes down in Z direction, Z axis goes and picks up the part from the conveyor. There is no RZ. Very, the very first part was in line with the uh, x-axis of the conveyor belt origin, so there is no rotation. Uh, and then after placing that part, the, the second uh, Z motion that you see here, the second Z profile that you see here is the placing of the first part. After the first part was placed, uh, since all the four parts were, were uh, obtained using one camera position, uh, we know that once once one part is in the sync zone, all the other parts are also in the sync zone. So as soon as it came back after picking the first part, you can see that the buffer was the buffer had a part in it. So it need not go back to the hover position above the conveyor. It actually would uh, f execute the conveyor track block and go to the zero PCS move uh, to hover over the part immediately. And you can see that here in the plot that the RZ to go to find the zero of the part already started as soon as it came back up from uh, placing. As soon as it came back up from placing, the RZ motion started, which is essentially the, con the PCS move to zero is, is already active in this place. You can, see that, you can see that this is that PCS move that, that took it to over the part, hovering over the part. And once that PCS zero move was done, uh, the Z axis moved down to pick the next part, came back up, and then went again rapidly to the static place position. And that basically gets repeated for part number three, pick for part number three and place for part number three, pick for part number four, place for part number four. And you can see that it takes longer time for the uh, gantry TCP to get to the fourth part just because we had a Relatively, we, we had simulated a relatively slow PCS move to get to the part um, so that you could see the, you know, how long it took for it to get there. But you, you should also note that the conveyor is now moving farther and farther away from the origin of the gantry. So it, it takes slightly longer for it to get there with the same speed as before. You can see in the uh, second graph, the X position, you can also see that it's increasing every time it's picking up a part, which means it's getting farther and farther down the conveyor to pick up these parts. So you can really see that uh, it's, it's got to do you know, all four parts back and forth. Here's a uh, top-down view of this conveyor tracking motion that uh, we, we referred to in the previous slide. Uh, you can see that the, uh, the, the X, uh, positive X uh, axis is the X axis of the conveyor in, in position, and the uh, Y axis of this plot is the Y axis of our MCS as well. The place position is a static place position. Uh, the very first move was to go and hover over the uh, conveyor's origin or the CBO place. Uh, 
And when the part was first detected, when the part basically gets first detected and a PCS gets created, when conveyor tracking is busy, when the PCS gets created, uh, this linear move here is the PCS move to zero. So this linear move from the hover position happened, and then as the part came along, it started tracking. Now you had to no note that this was a, you know, this, this uh, distance is slightly longer than the other conveyor track portions here because this was a move that was starting from zero speed, so it took longer to ramp up to speed and then do the, con do the tracking. The speed matching area was probably shorter, would, would have matched this uh, length of the conveyor here. Uh, the rest of it is basically the S-curve uh, attempt to speed match. Once it's speed matched, uh, it goes back to the static location. From when, when it placed the part at the static location and came back up, uh, the MCS move to this hover position was fired, but since there was a part, that particular move got aborted by the PCS move to get the next part. So you don't see any trace of that MCS move at all. You can see that as soon as it, the MCS move got done, we checked for buffer, there was part in the buffer, and the conveyor track block got executed, as well as that PCS move to zero got executed, which gives it this slightly curved uh, uh, profile uh, to get to the, uh, the conveyor, or get to the part that is on the conveyor. And this is the move back for the second part. Again, for the third part, move, conveyor track, going back. So the same sequence can be uh, executed. Now, if the buffer is empty, this, uh, the fourth part would basically have cost, uh, the, after, the, after the fourth part was placed, uh, if the buffer were empty, the MCS move would uh, cause the TCP to move down and wait at the hover position, waiting for a next trigger, waiting for a next part to come, come across. Yeah, you can also see in this, uh, the, the first and the last tracking are at a higher uh, Y value than the, the middle two. In other words, um, this horizontal line and this horizontal line are different than the two that are here in the middle. And the reason for that is because you have some, uh, the first and the last parts that we acted on are coming in to the positive Y side of the conveyor belt origin, and the middle two are coming in at the negative Y side of the conveyor belt origin. So you can picture the part moving from, or the parts moving from left to right across the screen um, in kind of a, a, a square configuration, the four parts. Hmm. What we just talked about is kind of when we know that we have parts coming back and we're kind of not moving back to that tool center point, that kind of hover position in the sink in zone. Um, because we know that we have another part to act on. So it kind of immediately starts doing that synchronization or that tracking. But what happens if we do a move back to our tool center point while we have something that's been triggered but has not yet entered the sync zone? So this leading part here has been triggered, we know about it, but it has not entered the sync zone. Well, we don't just wanna wait up here until it enters the sync zone because that's gonna waste time that we could be using to get in that general direction. Um, but we can't do a, um, we don't necessarily uh, um, want to do a, a PCS move either, but what we're going to do is our standard MCS move kind of to this hover position, and then as soon as it gets in the range, we'll do our PCS move uh, to zero, zero, zero. So we're going to tell it to do an MCS move uh, before we call tracking back to the center point of the sink in zone. And as it moves forward into that zone, we're going, to have, we're going to execute tracking, we're going to track along with it. And in addition, we also have our initial object position offset that the camera determined. So we kind of have those th three things working together. And if that happens on our return move home, you can see with the yellow line that we're on our way back to that uh, center of that sink in zone when the tracking begins and we'll just kind of uh, blend right in to our part uh, as that happens. And we have another graph of that as well. Again, this is a, a plot of your uh, top view of your uh, X and Y uh, motion. This is, uh, this is the, 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 from left to right is the positive direction of conveyor travel. And, and on the Y axis, you have your Y coordinate of your gantry's TCP. Place position is the uh, constant position there. Um, and this is the example where uh, 
your your uh, part or the, the camera triggered and found parts while you were already on the PCS move. So you were you were already halfway through the PCS move when the camera triggered found a part. And, and as soon as the part got got uh, fell into the buffer, uh, we fired the conveyor track block to create a PCS with the first part. And that PCS would uh, uh, that P that would trigger a PCS move, which would make the conveyor or make the TCP actually flow and uh, want to track the part as it as it went into the sync zone and you can see here that you know if, if your part got triggered uh, while the while the MCS moved to the hover position was active it would actually follow and, and follow this blended trajectory so the straight line down to this location uh, the minus 30 would have been the MCS move if it had completed uh, or, or if the part were not obtained while it was in motion but in this case since it was obtained while the uh, move was active uh, the PCS move got blended with that MCS move, uh, and you can see here that it tracks the conveyor. And this is the move back. Uh, again, the, while while it while it was on its move back home or towards the hover position on top of the conveyor, uh, if another part got triggered, uh, it would do this blend uh, to get to the tracking area. This this is the this is the PCS move to zero that blended or aborted the MCS move back to the home. And you can see the XY um, trajectory of that path that the TCP took to make sure that it tracked the conveyor. And then this is the, this is the move back to the place position. So this, you might not end up in the situation if you have a camera triggering multiple parts, because you, you know, if, a, if a camera triggers multiple parts, uh, you, 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 will, you will essentially um, um, you'll essentially start from here and automatically start tracking. This is an example of where you might have certain situations where uh, the camera triggering is not always getting parts. You know, there, there might be triggers of the camera that may not have parts and you might, you might end up having to go back and hovering at this position. And maybe on the way back you, you find parts that come through. So this is the case where you might have parts that are not e evenly distributed or your, your part spacing is not very even and you don't have a high density of parts coming along your conveyor and you don't know that, you could, you could still, uh, uh, with the same programming logic, you could still get conveyor tracking. And the, the code between those two examples is exactly the same. On the previous one we showed, I'll go up a couple slides here. The previous one we showed, we're not seeing any of that move back to the zero position along the left-hand side of the graph here because it's immediately being, because we already have something in the buffer, it's immediately being aborted and replaced with the PCS move to zero, zero, zero. That is the information that we have for our um, webinar today. One thing we'd like to mention is that if you want some practical hands-on experience with this, our training department is currently working on a advanced programming workshop for conveyor tracking. Check yaskawa.com slash training or uh, email training at yaskawa.com and ask them to send you an email when it's ready. That does end our presentation. If you have any questions at this time, uh, please go ahead and ask them in the chat box. We do have one uh, that we'll talk about as we're uh, waiting for more to come in, and that is when we're capturing part locations with a vision system, uh, how do we get rid of or check to see if there are duplicate parts? In other words, if the um, field of view between one shot, maybe a part was all the way to the uh, trailing side, and then when you took the next picture, now it's all the way to the uh, leading edge, how do, we, uh, how do we deal with that? Uh, one way of dealing with that is if you're delta in recorded position, uh, is, is basically the same as the X position that you captured in, in your camera, then you know that it's a duplicate part. So there are various algorithms that are available. I mean, some of these algorithms are already built into camera systems, uh, but one way we have done it is by checking, a simple way of checking is to make sure that the uh, delta in recorded positions uh, do not, or, or if the delta in the recorded positions are is equal to the delta in the X uh, coordinate of your initial object position, then that means that part basically has been duplicated. So that's, that's an easy way of uh, figuring that out. But it is an important part if you do not want your TCP to go to the same location again. Uh, you know, uh, there may be cases where that is necessary. For example, if parts are stacked one on top of the other, uh, that's going to be very difficult with a 
with a two-dimensional camera vision system. Uh, uh, so th there are uh, mechanical things that the machine builder has to do to make sure that uh, parts are not stacked on top of each other, but it's a, it's a valid situation where you might run into uh, uh, situations where, where parts are stacked on one on top of the other. All right, well, thank you, everybody, for attending this webinar. Uh, we have no other questions to answer at this point, so we, uh, we very much appreciate you uh, attending this webinar, and uh, hopefully you'll have a chance to try out conveyor tracking soon, and um, let us know if you have questions. We'll be happy to help you out. Thank you very much.